Uh, I, wish, I wish we could be there, you know, really. But anyway, we're going to go to Italy tonight. Now, Italy really is less a country and more a sort of group of regions with lots of differences and not just in the people. The characters are very different from north to south, but also the foods they eat. Um, you know, actually, they don't all eat pasta. Pasta is mm -hmm. only in certain regions. They don't all eat rice. Rice they tend to eat in, in certain regions. So I think it's very fair to say that the wines we're going to taste tonight are going to be very different because they're all from different regions. But um, there's 20 different wine regions in Italy. And the, the Italians like to tell you that there's over 2000 grape varieties. But I think that's actually not totally true. I think there's only mm -hmm. about 350 that are actually recognized grape varieties. And they probably double up on some of those, but they just give them regional names because I think it's quite a region in, um, in Italy. Ah, here's Karen. I think the thing to bear in mind, Penny, about Italy when it comes to gastronomy of any sort, food and drink, is what people tend to forget is two things. Firstly, that the north of Italy is in the Alps as you're yeah. heading into Austria on the Brenner Pass. Yep. And the south of Italy in Sicily, right down at Syracuse, is on a level with Marrakesh in Morocco. So, you know, you've gone from sort of desert heat to alpine snow, all, but we all put it in one country. In fact, last year or the year before, I was um, treated to a lovely day out at um, Highgrove. And there was a talk by Tom Parker Bowles and Angela Hartnett. Uh, talk about name dropping. No, they were doing the talk. I just got a ticket. Um, but they were talking about Italian food. And they were saying the problem is, from an English perspective, that if you go in an Italian restaurant in the UK, it's almost a, um, now that's what I call Italian. It's the top 20 dishes that we've all heard of. Yeah. Now, one, you would never have bolognese sauce with spaghetti in Italy. Exactly. You'd have it with something else. Um, and you've got stuff from the north where we're going to be looking at first. We've got stuff from yeah. the south where we're going to be looking at second. We've got stuff from the middle and then stuff that we've made up. So yeah. we never really see what regional Italian is. Whereas tonight, hopefully, we're going to see a little bit more of that. Yeah, exactly. So I'd just like to welcome Karen and Florin and her two guests who are with us tonight, one of whom's birthday it was fairly soon. So happy birthday. Thank you. Happy Bye. birthday. <laughs> Sarah, I'm Tim. And Hi, Sarah, Tim. Karen and Florin, nice to see you. Um, just to give you a quick recap, my name is Penny Hayes and I'm the co-founder of Great Wine Online and I'm here tonight with Steve Il Formaggio Parker and we're going to take you through Italy from the north to the south. We were just saying that you know Italy is less of a, of a country and more of a, com a combination of different regions with different characters, not only with the people but also with the foods and the wines that they, they drink. So um, 20 different wine regions. I've actually got a little um, map here I'm going to show you, um, just to show you approximately where most of them are. Can you see my screen there? And so you can see all of those colored areas are all the different wine regions in Italy, some of which you may never have heard of. Um, but the one we're gonna to go to tonight is uh, for, the, for our first glass of, of wine, and I hope you've all poured one, is a Prosecco. Now, not many people know this, but actually Prosecco is the name of a village, a very cute village. In fact, that photograph there is, is supposed to be a picture of the village from the air. Um, I don't think many people knew that. It is in fact, um, also it was, I should say, the name of the grape that most of the Prosecco that we know of was made, is made from. But Steve, I think they changed the name of the grape. About yeah, what, what happened was, the grape had traditionally, as you say, been called Prosecco. And then in, I think it was about 2009, 2010, something like that, the villages on your map there of Valdo Biardine and Corneliano applied for the higher level of appellation in, in Italian wine. So they wanted to be a, a more superior product. And the problem was the European regulatory authorities who look after such things said, this is very confusing because the wine is called Prosecco and the grape is called Prosecco. So you could actually make Prosecco in Slovenia, uh, as they do, for example. So well, how, how on earth are we going to do that? Because they would have used a grape called Prosecco and they just write Prosecco on the label. And well, they the, would the, 
the, the word Prosec is actually a Slovenian name originally. So they do make Prosec and they also make it in exactly. Croatia. And yeah. they, they make it. So what they were doing was making a wine with the grape called Prosecco. Mm -hmm. And everyone said, this is far too complicated. We can't get our heads around this. So the grape is now internationally called Glera. G-L-E-R-A. -E -E Which isn't a particularly romantic name for <laughs> what is actually no. a lovely wine. And Prosecco is a protected um, name for wines from that region if it's Prosecco DOC or Prosecco DOCG. You also get it in two different variants, or actually three different variants. Um, Spumante, Frizzante, and then there's one called um, Tranquilo, which is a still Prosecco, which you don't see very much of over here. But the one we're drinking tonight is a Spumante, which is the more bubbly. Um, the Frizzante tends to have fewer bubbles in it. And usually, Quite often comes in a, with a cork with a bit of string around it and can come sometimes with a, a cork yeah a, a, what do you call it a crown cap though like the beer but this one we're drinking tonight is a um is a spumante the more more um bubbly one which is why it had a a, a a proper cork in it with a wire cage over the top um but like you say there's two main areas really that applied for the uh sort of top-notch doc which is their equivalent of the French Appellation, and that was, and I'm going to really struggle with the names of these, but Congeliani, Val, Val, I can't say it. Col Valdo Biardine. <laughs> yeah, well the, it's the emphasis on the the, sim, the, uh, the the syllables that seem wrong to us. It's Valdo Biardine and Congeliano. That's right. <laughs> it's very hard to say. It's a good job Lorenzo's is not here yet. He'd be appalled. Um, but. The other thing that's quite interesting about Prosecco, which I didn't know until fairly recently, is that uh, it was only in the last year, I think, that they've allowed a rosé Prosecco to be made. You yeah. couldn't have that before now. Yeah, and, and, and that was a legacy of the, the thing I discussed earlier on, because the way they make that is they use the Glera grape, but they also use another grape called Raboso, which gives it the pink colour. Now, are they allowed to do that in, in, a, in a DOC Prosecco or not? Yes. They are. But only we they are, but only since the 2019 vintage. Okay, great. So you're just seeing it appearing in the UK. Great. Now, another thing um, we need to tell people about Prosecco is it's not made in the traditional method that we've come across with in other tastings we've done, our sparkling tasting, such as um, champagne, obviously, cava, um, even the uh, cap classique that we've seen in South Africa or in the method Marlborough that they call it in New Zealand. It's the method, was called the method champanoise, it's now called the method traditionnel, where they ferment the, the wine in the bottle and they turn it every day a quarter of a, a quarter of a turn and all the sediment comes down to the bottom of the cork and then they let that fly out and then they put their liquor in. That's the sort of traditional method. Uh, Prosecco is made in what's known very romantically as the Charmat method, but actually it's fermented in a steel tank. And that tends to give it a much, much cleaner, probably fresher taste in some respects, because you're not getting, the wine hasn't sat on the lees, which is all those sort of dead yeast cells in the, in the bottle, uh, hardly at all. So it's getting a much fresher, much ar more aromatic flavor. So I've not tried this one yet, I'm about to. So I'm hoping that what I've just said is actually gonna be true. But certainly it smells very fresh and very floral. Very light, very light. By the way, I'm using a flute tonight, not my coupe. And that's um, mainly because I've been battered by both Steve and a couple of our other winemakers to say that actually the flute is a lot better <laughs> glass to protect to maintain the bubbles and the flow of the bubbles the coop tends to let the bubbles all disappear but you know i'm, I'm using my yours, yours is too small penny that's the problem <laughs> well yes can't really get my nose in it. <laughs> anyway yeah, you, were, you were saying about charmat um penny um i mean it, this is exactly the same thing happens here as happens in those other wines that you've got a secondary fermentation you know, initially the sugar in the grapes, in the Glera grapes here, ferments to create alcohol. And then instead of putting it in a bottle to do the secondary fermentation, they do it, as you say, in a stainless steel tank um, to retain that cleanliness. 
mm. and that crispness. And exactly the same thing's happening. There's just a bit more must, as they call it, which, which is the, the sugary solution for the grapes, is put in there with some yeast. And the, as it, and the tank is sealed, completely sealed. And it starts producing all this carbon dioxide and all this heat. Um, and the carbon dioxide just dissolves in the wine. But they keep it sealed until it gets to five atmospheres, which is the same pressure as the tyre of a double-decker bus. So that is a huge pressure. Um, but what it does do that's brilliant, and this is where people often get it confused between Champagne and Prosecco, for example, is because that's happening on that scale, it, the cost of manufacture is lower. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, rather mm. than doing it in, in glass bottles. And that's why the wine comes out at a lower price. It is in no way inferior, and Champagne is in no way superior, although I think the French might argue that point. <laughs> yeah, they would. <laughs> but it's, it's just a different way of doing it. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and therefore that cost saving is passed on to us as the consumers. Yeah, definitely. So I'm assuming with that level of um, pressure, it's similar to a, a bottle of, of champagne that the cork will come out at an incredible speed. And it's somewhere around about 25 miles an hour they come out of the bottle, don't they? So you just be really careful. Um, I mean, I get very nervous when I see people, you know, flicking the, flicking the, the caps of or the corks out of champagne bottles towards people because, you know, that, it's pretty dangerous. And it's the same with a Prosecco bottle, presumably, as well, which is why this Spumante had the cage over the top. Yeah. Yep. There's yep. something else I need to tell you about Prosecco. And this is one designed to mess with your head, but this is very typically Italian. Sorry, Lorenzo, as I see you've joined us. Um, <laughs> <It's> hiding. <laughs> this is a brute Prosecco. So this is quite dry. They then make one called an extra dry, which is sweet. Just to confuse you. That is the, very Italian. <laughs> the brute is the driest. Extra dry is slightly sweet. And therefore, when we come to the food bit in a moment, um, I will explain what you would have if you had a Prosecco that said extra dry on it. But we don't get a lot of extra dry in the UK, to be fair. I was last time I was in Italy, which was, you know, feels like eons ago. Um, I drank a lot of the frizzanti, which is a less um, fizzy. And they seem to drink that with 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 food, possibly more than they drink uh, the with food. But of course, um, the classic is the Bellini cocktail that was uh, apparently developed in, I think, the 1950s in Harry's Bar in Venice by putting um, peach puree into the bottom of the glass and then filling it with Prosecco. But Lorenzo can tell us later that, in fact, marinating peaches in wine in Italy is quite a tradition. It's been going on for years and years and years. So this is really just an extension of that by having this uh, delicious uh, cocktail. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I have to tell you, Steve, these salamis smell amazing tonight. They're just waft the smell is wafting off the plate. But um, which of the cheeses are you going to suggest that we eat with this? Right. For those, for those who have cheese with them. You should possibly recognize three things like this. I've cut some pieces off here. You have a pure white one here with a soft white rind on it, which yep. was in a square, and that's called a Robbiolo Bossino. Yeah. Nearly fell off this late. You then have the, and that's what we're going to have with the Prosecco. Okay. We then have the Telegio, which has got a slightly sort of squidgy texture and an orangey rind. And then you've got the Pecorino, which is the hard one, which is what we'll have with Lorenzo's excellent wine at the end. Okay. So the first cheese you've got here, Robbiolo Bacino, is a what's called a Due Latte cheese, which sounds like you've just gone into Costa or somewhere and ordered two coffees. But Due Latte actually means two milks. Um, and it, it's because this particular um, cheese has been made with cow's milk and with sheep's milk. And this blending of different animals is hugely popular in Piedmont. Now, Piedmont is in the top left-hand corner of Italy, um, the bit heading across towards Switzerland. And the wine comes from um, the Veneto, which is the top right-hand corner, but they're both Northern Italy. Um, so what you've got is this tradition in uh, Piemonte of, as I say, blending different animals' milk. Sometimes you'll get cow, sheep, and goat all together. Wow. This is just cow and sheep. Um, 
It's made in a place called um, Bosia, uh, B-O-S-I-A, Bosia, which is halfway between Turin and Genoa. Um, I don't know how well you guys know Italy, but Turin, looking around the room, you will always rem you'll all remember the Italian job. It's where the boys um, went racing their minis through the tunnels. That, that's Turin. I know, I know or, that bit. <laughs> or Torino, as the Italians would call it. Um, and that's right up in the sort of lakes region in, in the center of, um, of uh, Piedmont, near places like Alba and Asti. And if you head from there towards the coast, the, the coast is Genoa, um, and you would go through Bosia on the way. So this is an area called the Alte Langa, big wine making region, big cheese making region. Really good. So what, what you've got is a deliciously creamy cheese here. It's got, um, it's sort of a bit grassy, a bit hay, a bit buttery. Now, I, I don't know about you guys, I've never eaten buttered hay, but they're, <laughs> they're the sort of flavours that I find you get with this. And it's a lovely, soft, delicate cheese. It has a real delicacy to it. You, you know, for those who only ever had red wine with cheese, you wouldn't want red wine with this. It would, it would kill it. Kill it. I'm going to uh, ask the question I always ask you. You can eat the rind on this as well. Oh, goodness. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, delicious, yeah. delicious cheese. Uh, but it has a real delicacy. Um, if I wasn't having this, I would go for something like a buffalo milk mozzarella or a okay. burrata. Oh, we've all got to smile. The Karen's guys are taking a photograph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Uh, something like a buffalo milk mozzarella or any other very delicate cheese. If you wanted to be support British cheese making, which I think most of you know that I, I'm a big fan of, there's a stunningly good cheese, very similar to this, called Wigmore, made Ooh, by a lady yeah. ca called Anne Wigmore in Berkshire. Um, and it's soft, delicate sheep's cheese as well. So that would work beautifully with this. You could get away with um, a brie or a camembert with this. Um, yeah. Would, could go with this Prosecco, but the Prosecco lends itself to a vast array of foods. And we'll come back to the salami in a moment. I did mention earlier on, if you happen to find yourself with something called extra dry Prosecco, is, which is the sweet one, um, <laughs> tends to lend itself to um, um, sort of having with sweet foods. But this, this style, the brute style, let me give you a long list of things you can have for this Prosecco. It works beautifully with Parma ham. It works beautifully with Parma ham wrapped around some asparagus spears and dipped in some lemon mayonnaise. Fantastic. That would work beautifully. It works with sushi. It works with seafood, particularly Asian seafood, not too spicy. So keep away from the chili, but yeah. things like your sesame prawn on toast. If you're a sucker for those, beautiful with this. Things like a prawn um, dim sum, you know, those little dumpling things yep. you get, um, wontons, and, you know, absolutely perfect. Now, one that always surprises you, Penny, because I know it's traditionally quite a hard thing to bear, is eggs. Yeah. But where this works really nicely, and I've tried this before, is deviled eggs. If you okay. remember those dinner parties we used to go to about 100 years, and I mean long time ago, when literally you take out the yolks and you... Uh, of a hard boiled egg and you mix it with a little bit of mayonnaise, a little bit of paprika or some cayenne pepper and then put it back in. If you're really posh, you get a piping bag and do it so it's all very posh. So My mother actually has a plate that has egg shaped dips all the way around the outside that you put those in. So I'm oh, going to get fantastic. that. <laughs> fantastic. How very retro and lovely. Um, the thing that is really nice with Prosecco, and I can guarantee this, is a garlic and herb tear and share. Ooh. which is like a focaccia style bread made with loads of olive oil. Olive oil is a good friend to this wine and with some garlic and herb and that, you know, that teary soft yeah. stuff that you do. Um, and a final one is a squid ink risotto. I'll come back to squid later, but squid ink risotto is a huge um, Venetian dish. If it you, is. It's a very traditional. Personally, I think it's gross, folks. I, no, I've, I, I do not Venice, like squidding, but it does work quite well. I've had cuttlefish um, in yeah. risotto in Venice, and it was delicious, but you had to close your eyes because that black colour is just really off-putting. But I know what Who you mean. It should look black, should it? 
unless you watched master chef this week when the winner did a lot of black and white stuff he, he was very good at that yeah i didn't watch that <laughs> oh no it's very good sorry if that was a spoiler for anybody that didn't see it last <laughs> night i oh, just realized um and um you you've got some spiced i haven't got salami with me tonight but it's the hampshire salami spiced isn't it it is which is a very soft um a soft one of the of the several that we've got here the hampshire spiced it's a very soft it's what they call a suppressor um style so it's it's basically just pork with salt and pepper it hasn't got anything else in it it's a very gentle salami it smells incredible I mean, it's been sitting in my office now for about the last half an hour and it just smells absolutely fabulous so sorry steve <laughs> not at all i have tried it as um i'm sure the, as you you're you're too polite to talk with a mouthful um the, these salamis are made by um barry the salami wrangler from hampshire and barry has a fantastic mo um, logo or motto which is he's curing hampshire one pig at a time and this guy owns a beautiful um farm shop deli curing facility on some land owned by um a, a member of the landed aristocracy who I can't remember he's the duke of something but he's, he's got some this sort of farm shop there and his big thing is making salami he's traveled extensively in Italy with, with some good friends of his and wherever they've rocked up they've gone to almost knocked on the door of a of a family and sat there with Nonna who is who is grandmother um and picked up these traditional regional family recipes this one's actually from Veneto isn't it Penny, it's from the Veneto region so it comes from the same region as the as the yeah. Prosecco that we're drinking and of course how often have we said that you know drink and eat, drink the food drink with the food I'll get my words out drink and eat the same things that come from the same kind of region because they're made to go together same terroir yeah. all that kind of thing so this actually does come from well the recipe comes from the Veneto region Exactly. So, so hand, literally handmade by a good friend and, and partner of ours in Hampshire. Um, uh, it's called Hampshire salami, and the suppressor style is a very soft style of salami. Some sal salamis can be quite bitey, quite chewy, whereas this has quite a softness to it. With lots of lovely bits of fat in it through it as well. I mean, yeah. it really is quite delicious. Um, quite funny. Some people get really concerned about the F word. But yeah. at the end of the day, it's fat in food that carries the flavour. Exactly. It gives it the flavor. So it's very, very thin amounts of it there. So I think that's a lovely little pairing we've got going on there with this soft creamy cheese, this soft um, salami and this rather lovely Prosecco. pear smelling Prosecco. Pear is always a good smell in a Prosecco. Like now I'm, I'm struggling with that. I'm struggling to smell pear um, and we again we quite often say that you know just because one of us smells something doesn't mean to say the others are wrong if they can't smell it I don't get pears at all on this one sorry Steve maybe it's, it's because on the, palate, the, on the palate the, the salami has overtaken it but it's I mean it's delicious it's lovely and fruity and light um delicious delicious prosecco hmm. everybody happy with all of those pairings there I think everybody Quite happy drinking that uh, for a second. Quite, there's happy smiley faces to quote the song words. Now I'm just going to say hi to Lorenzo. Ciao Lorenzo, come stai? Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, I'm okay, are you okay? Good. good to see you. I'm sure you're sitting there thinking salami, English. <laughs> English salami, very good. Now the next wine we're going to taste tonight is from Sicily. So we've gone right down the south. Well, the Cilis, it will be probably a surprise to most people to know that Sicily actually has more vines than Australia, Chile and Bulgaria all put together. Yep. It makes huge quantities of wine. And up until relatively recently, it was pretty rough. It was pretty, well, sorry, that's the wrong word. Rustic, I think is the polite way of calling the wines that they make in Sicily. Um, predominantly white, interestingly. And going back to what you were saying, Steve, about the the different climates in Italy. Of course, on, on Sicily, you've got Mount Etna. So we've spoken to our, our very good friend, Ben in Chile quite often about his volcanic soil that he's growing wines in, but clearly in, in Sicily, they'll have that kind of uh, volcanic soil too, but they have a really mixed climate given that they're mm. a Southern, the most Southern, are they the most Southern? 
Uh, Ireland in the Mediterranean is that Malta, but they're they're pretty close to each other. To each other in in in. So in Mal Malta is slightly further south. Yeah. Okay. So um, you've got Mount Etna, which obviously um, I'm not sure it's erupted recently, but it's certainly got the volcanic um, terroir there. So um, a really interesting combination of, of wines coming out of Sicily and they're getting better. I think they've realised that they need to up their game a bit and they're starting to get a, a lot better than they were. The key thing about Sicily in terms of its, um, its wine climate, if you like, is that it's a long way south. As I say, you know, you're into North African latitudes yeah so yeah. i've spent quite a lot of time in sicily wine buying which has been quite good fun and in the height of summer temperatures can reach into the high 40s and even tip into the 50s mm. now i've got to tell you folks 50 degrees c is oh. baking hot yeah but it's for those who, who are rubbish with geography it's the football on the end of the foot of italy hold on Hold on, I'll show you. Which is like a, it's a sort of triangle. Um, I'll show you where it is. There you go. It's so it that's that's in the little circle there. It shows you the the the, yeah. the boot that is uh, the thigh length boot that is Italy, and then it's off the bottom there in that red bit. But then Can this you just keep the map up for a second, Penny. Sure. The bottom right hand corner down near Syracuse, there. Yeah. This is where these Grio grapes are coming from. And I'm going to talk to you about Grio grapes in a moment. Okay. This is Syracuse. So what you've got here, although it is bakingly hot, as I say, it is totally surrounded by water. And although the Mediterranean is quite warm, um, in, in terms of grape growing, it's quite cold. And the ocean in any gr grape growing region moderates the temperature, acts as quite a nice coolant. Mm. So you've got quite a high, I, I think Ben calls it the diurnal shift or something like that. The difference between the daytime temperature and the nighttime temperature is quite extreme, quite a big spread, because this ocean, the, you know, the winds coming off, off the Mediterranean really yeah. cool the grapes down at night. But the reason this, this griot is such a popular variety in um, Sicily is that it's quite resistant to heat. Well, they have a very long um, harvest season, don't they, in, in Sicily? It, it can be up to three months. That They start in August and it, they can be going on to November. So there's all sorts of interesting wine traditions that are being busted by, by Sicily in, in some respects. The other thing to bear in mind is in the top left-hand corner, that sort of lime green bit up in the top left there, that's where Masala is, ah. and where Masala wine comes from, which I'll come back to in a second. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, um, Grio is actually a cross. Most Sicilian grape varieties are what what you'd consider to be ancient varieties that have been around for a thousand years, if not back to Roman times. And, and obviously, the Romans knew a bit about wine. There, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. Um, but Grio is a relatively new cross. Um, in fact, in the late nineteenth century. And it's a cross between a variety that some of you guys may have seen, which is indigenous to Sicily, called Catarato. How do you spell that? Cat with two T's. Yep. Uh, a rato. I can't put it in the chat at the moment, but yeah, okay. Cat, a catarato. Okay. Um, and it's a cross between that and something called Zibibo, which I think is a lovely great variety. So if you're ever challenged to write down a great variety with every letter of the alphabet, this is your Z <laughs> if, you, if your opposition has chosen Zinfandel. So you can have Zibibo, um, which is, it sounds like a, a sort of high-end ladies fashion shop from the 70s, doesn't it, Zibibo? Um, and <laughs> Zibibo yeah, is actually, okay. it, no, it, it's, a, it's a Muscat style of grape that's quite popular in Southern Italy. And you, you said earlier on, Penny, 2,000 grape varieties. It wouldn't yeah, exactly. surprise me at all. Exactly. Um, so you, it's mentioned, you mentioned Muscat, and actually this has got a, a slight overtone of what I would, I would expect, that sort of floralness from Muscat. But actually, you were saying that um, in Sicily they make... Uh, I've completely forgotten the word. It's not Madeira, it's Masala. Masala... And they also make a muscat, so they are actually quite well known for their desert 
dessert wines. They're sort of sweet mm. pudding wines. Well, Grio is one of the grapes used to make masala mm. because Grio is um, is quite robust and can stand up to the heat. So it, it works particularly well when you're making a sort of big fortified wine like this. Yeah. Um, Right, so 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 that's Grio. Now the guys that make this, it, one, it's an organic. They're organically grown grapes. So for those who like an organic diet, big tick on this one. Um, and secondly, that they have a what they call a partial picking method, which is bloody costly, folks. I have to tell you, but basically, instead of using machine harvesting, which is obviously massively efficient and quite low cost, they send teams of um, workers through the vineyard picking the bunches that are ripe and then they go through two days later and pick any that are ripe then and then and they do that like three or four times that's hugely expensive that is expensive and it's a style of picking that's normally used in quite high-end wines so you know th this is incredibly good value given when you know what's gone into it yeah. um but they um <clears throat> the key thing is because of the heat because of the style of the grape if you're not careful you lose acidity in the winemaking so those who are regular viewers may have heard us talk about malolactic fermentation which is when you um you use naturally occurring bacteria to soften wines here the trick is to stop malolactic fermentation they absolutely don't want it Otherwise, you lose acidity. And if you lose acidity in wine, that's when it becomes what pretentious people like Penny and I call flabby. Flabby. <laughs> it's flabby, which is not a good description for either a wine or, or a person <laughs> or a <laughs> cucumber. It's really not a good description. <laughs> so it's this acidity which gives us this refreshing characteristic in a wine and makes it makes it sort of lip smacking and, and how well it pairs with foods. So, you know, the acidity. So what you've got here is a fabulous wine, 100% Grio from Sicily that goes with a whole load of beautiful things. Well, it's quite citrusy and there's a bit of tropical fruit, fruit in there, I, can, I think. So I'd quite happily drink this on its own. It's actually quite a nice sort of light, refreshing wine to have for the summer. But yeah, go on then. What, what are you going to pair it with? No, I, I'm just laughing at you. you, you. <laughs> your um, your newfound integrity in when, in terms of when you drink wine. <laughs> All the time. Penny, Penny and I <laughs> both enjoy drinking wine a lot, and we taste a lot of wines. Um, <laughs> huge difference, you know. I, I probably taste about fifty wines a week. Um, that doesn't mean I drink them; I spit them out and all that. But but anyway, we, we both enjoy our wine. We really do. But it's very good for you. It is extremely good for you. Right, so which of the cheeses are we pairing with this Right, one? this is time for Taleggio. Um, now, why have we not got Sicilian cheese? I'll tell you what, because it's too bloody hot to make cheese in Sicily. Yeah. Um, you do actually get a, a Pecorino <coughs> Siciliano, which is made in Sicily, but we're having the Pecorino from Toscano in a tribute to Lorenzo and awesome. his fabulous wines <laughs> later. So what we've got here is Taleggio. Taleggio is what's called a... God, I hate it now. I've got a, a, a native Italian a, and an Italian speaker on, on screen. Uh, this is what's called a stracchino cheese. Um, stracchino means tired, um, which if you translate it literally, that's not a good description. I've got some tired cheese. Tired uh, cheese. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what it means is cows that have been grazing on fresh grass pasture during the summer, at the end of the season, when they're brought down off of mountains and hillsides, uh, back to the valley floor and start eating silage, they describe the the milk as tired. And what it means is it's the end of the season and it's become richer through the silage than it is from the freshness of the grass. Okay. You can imagine grass is very fresh, hay is it gives a creaminess to it. So tired is is probably not the right translation. That's literally what it means. Um, and this cheese is a rind washed cheese, which means it's been washed in salt water, which gives it that sticky, soft, pungent, orangey, pinky rind. What you will notice, depends on the cut you've got, the rind may have what looks like some branding on it. 
um, you know, as if a brand has been put on it, you know, like cowboys used to do on the back of cattle. And the, yeah. the reason being that a telegio is made as about a nine or 10 inch square, flat square, but a bit like a, a really thick floor tile, if you can imagine. <coughs> and um, the what they do is they stamp in the four corners of the square, three letter T's in a circle, like Sergio Tacchini, those track suits worn by Chavs. Um, that was an awful thing to say. Um, so it's a T in a circle, they stamp three of those, and then the brand of the actual producer, and that shows you it's a genuine artisan made Telegio. Fabulous cheese, it's from Lombardia in the north. Um, beautiful, beautiful cheese. The, uh, the top recipe tip with this cheese, get yourself a bowl of spaghetti, or linguine, whatever is your favourite. Cook it al dente. So it's got a tiny little bit of crunch. Toss it in olive oil and black pepper. Put it into a baking dish. Put slices of this on the top. Chuck it in the oven for about five minutes, and it just melts into it. It's gorgeous. Now that's interesting because I've never eaten telegio on its own. I've only ever used it or seen it used in recipes before. So presumably, it is a cheese that you cook with. Goodness, yes. But I've never seen it on a cheese board. I don't think just like this. But I have to say, it is quite delicious. I actually prefer this one to the first one we had. Um, and, and the rind is delicious as, as, a, a, as ever, now that I'm used to eating cheese rind since meeting what, you. What you will find, Penny, with, with a couple of notable exceptions, we, we are mostly over the age of 25 on this screen tonight. Um, and the older you get, the, your palate needs stronger flavours. And the first one is has a real delicacy. Yeah. That, you know, Are you saying that my palate's shot, therefore I can't appreciate it? No. <laughs> I'm just saying you, you, you need a bit more flavour delivery to give you that kick that you, you're, you're craving. I, thank but, you. but being a Sicilian wine, <laughs> Italy is upside down compared to the UK socio-economically. There's a okay. sentence you never thought you'd hear me say. In Italy, the north is the affluent... Um, areas around Milan and Torino and Venice and Verona and the south is the rural areas which is about farming and generally a much lower standard of living but what it means is when you go south and by south I'm taking sort of either Rome uh, as the as the dividing line between the north and south or Napoli mm. or Naples but certainly once you go south of Naples you're definitely in the south of Italy and therefore the cuisine is very, I guess the polite way is to say a peasant cuisine. It's very vegetable based and it's not very tomato based. The North is all about tomatoes and it's all about meat. The South is about seafood and vegetables. So Grio is a wine that's made for vegetables. This Telegio has got quite a vegetal characteristic to it. If, if you can imagine it was slightly cabbagey yeah so any goat's cheeses work really well with this any of the alpine cheeses that you're such a fan of penny like yeah. fontina or um or, or um fontal or conte or gruyere would work beautifully with this yeah. wine but it's really vegetables is what this is all about so courgettes pesto roasted cauliflower mushroom risotto um, any any sort of vegetable, um, particularly grilled vegetables that's brought some flavour out, and a rocket salad, absolutely beautiful. You know, th these are all great things to go with this. Yeah, I can I get that. It's quite a fresh um, wine anyway, and I can imagine that that, that would work, work really really well with those vegetables. Um, it is probably the most well known white grape in, from Sicily, Grillo. They're not perhaps known. Particularly yeah, well. it's not really known for white grapes. You, you, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah we tend to think of Nero, Davila, and uh, exactly. I mean, there's the, the the red wines we probably will have heard of from Sicily are things like Nero, Davila, which is quite uh, quite well known over here. But um, I, for first time I've tasted this particular Grillo. I have had it before, Grillo that is before, but it's actually really quite 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 fresh and quite different. I'm quite enjoy. I'm quite enjoying this one. And the um, thing they've done that is really clever is got this in a relatively low alcohol. Now, I, I've, my bottle's in the fridge. 
I think it's about 12%, isn't it, Penny, something like that? Yeah, and interesting enough, the Prosecco is 11% tonight, so we're on, we're on um, a low alcohol kick tonight, <laughs> theoretically. Now, the um, salami that I would suggest we have with this one is the Coralino. Um, Coralino is traditionally apparently made around about Easter time. Um, I mean, now they make it all year round, but it is it is an Easter time um, type type uh, salami, so very appropriate. And again, huge chunks of fat in it, but it has it, it's it's a relatively spicy one compared to the one we had before, but but some kind of sweet spice, so sort of paprikary ish, um, and I think goes really really well with this. I tried a piece earlier on, and it's really delicious. So I'm going to speak with my mouthful again. You know what I'd do? I, I would get some courgette in quite thick slices, some aubergine in some quite thick slices, toss them all in some olive oil with a bit of black pepper, chuck some of this salami in with it, cut it into little pieces, nice. put some telegio on top and roast, bake the whole lot in the oven for 20 minutes. Okay, that's that delicious. would be stunning. You should have told us that before. We could have prepared that for later. I, I, I just made it up. <laughs> my, my creative palette was running away with me so now we don't just have to think of sicily as um you know corioni and malo brando and horses heads we've actually got some great wines that we can taste from um, and, and white wines that we can taste from um from sicily which i think are absolutely delicious so lorenzo we are now going to taste your moro rosso but before we do that um Great to have you with us again. Now, we spoke last week and it was a very sad news you had to tell us that the frost overnight had destroyed literally 20% of your grapes. Good evening, everyone. It's a big pleasure for me to introduce uh, our winery and I hope you can enjoy it with our Moro Rosso wine. Yes, Penny, last two week uh, in uh, Tuscany, but uh, in a big part of Italy and in France as well. Yeah. Uh, frozen a lot, not just the vineyard, but a lot of different fruit, uh, mm. tree fruit uh, frozen. In our case, we are so lucky because uh, the uh, springtime is not started very good. And so the vineyard, was uh, without flower and uh, we i think we lost uh, around 15 or 20 percent but it's too early to uh, to know now we need to wait a few weeks more but uh, considering the big situation uh, around the tuscany we are very lucky we have a colleague lost uh, 85 percent because uh, the vineyard was uh, with flower and uh, frozen everything so yes. Such a shame. That's really such a shame. So for those people who don't know, Lorenzo, um, <clears throat> you and I met originally about six years ago. I first met your wife, Isabella, and her father on uh, the tube station in Earl's Court uh, on our way to the wine fair. And all the trains were messed up and we ended up chatting. And I met uh, Primo and Isabella and then went to visit um or came to visit you in, in Tuscany and have been back several times for big parties. Um, you have a most fantastic vineyard and winery with a lot, and it's, it was a 12th century um, village, I think, wasn't it? And you have a little chapel up the street and all of the um, winery co workers' cottages have now been converted into um, places that we can all stay, which we're hoping to do again next year but it's been a fab it's absolutely fabulous um situation right in the middle of um the tuscan hills near arezzo now last week you took us around a virtual with a camera which to show everybody the view which is obviously it's too dark to do that this evening but um you're not far from arezzo explain whereabouts that is in 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 italy and i'll put up my little my little picture Yes, we are, we are located in the south of Tuscany region, just one hour in the south of Florence. And uh, it's uh, Arezzo, Arezzo area. We are just close uh, uh, from Umbria region as well, in the, center, in the center of Italy. Arezzo is a medieval town. It's uh, not so popular like Siena or Florence, but is uh, an authentic uh, uh, city to, to spend uh, amazing time, amazing holiday. And uh, 
in authentic Tuscany experience. It is. Um, I've got some photographs here of the winery itself. Um, I think I've stayed in that little cottage there. Definitely, it's absolutely fabulous. So explain a little bit about the history of Il Palazzo. It was originally a staging post, as we call it, on the, the, the salt route. So explain a little bit about all of that for us. Yes. Uh, we started to produce wine uh, after the Second World War in the 1946, when the grandfather and the grandmother of my wife bought the uh, Palazzo Farm. In the heart of the Palazzo Farm, there, are, there is the medieval village. In the past, uh, this village was a convent, and uh, now it's convertible in uh, agritourism and uh, we have uh, space for around uh, 35, 36 people uh, to stay in uh, 16 apartments in total. And uh, around the, the village, uh, we have uh, uh, 42 hectares of vineyard and 20 hectares with uh, around 6,000 6, of olive tree because we produce uh, uh, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil uh, uh, as well. So um, at the moment, we uh, export uh, our wine in the 22 different countries around the world, including your country, of course. And uh, we produce uh, many wine. And uh, this evening, uh, we are going to testing our super Tuscan wine, the Moro Rosso. Why Moro Rosso? Uh, or better, why super Tuscan? Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, Super Tuscan, it's not Italian name. The English and American people start to, to, to call uh, this kind of wine Super Tuscan. Why? Because it is made, it is produced with uh, Sangiovese grape, and Sangiovese grape is the most important and the most typical Tuscan grape, plus uh, uh, international grape like uh, Syrah and Merlot in our case. In other case, uh, the people can use Cabernet Sauvignon or Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot. It depends. Every winery has a different recipe. And when uh, you produce uh, Tuscan wine uh, but with international grape, why international grape? Because Sangiovese, you can produce just in Tuscany because it's a special grape. You need to care a lot of this grape because we have a special climate to produce this grape. It's not uh, possible to produce in the rest of uh, Italy and in the rest of the world. Just in Tuscany, it is possible. But uh, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, in our case, uh, Syrah and Merlot, it's uh, possible to produce everywhere around the world. There are amazing Syrah from France, amazing Merlot from France, amazing uh, uh, wine from the rest uh, of the world uh, in California, South America, South Africa, Australia. In our case, we use this kind of uh, grape uh, and uh, in the same part, uh, one third is Sangiovese, one third is Merlot and one third is um, Syrah. Why Moro Rosso? Moro Rosso is the name of the wine because in the, in the side of our road to arrive in our winery, we have mulberry tree. And uh, this mulberry tree produces fruit, uh, red fruit, very similar at blackberry. And for this, and, and in Tuscany, the people call the blackberry, in Tuscany, in Italy, oh, no. the exactly translator, it's uh, mora, mora. And uh, in Arezzo language, the people call, call this kind of tree uh, Moro. And we decided to call the wine Moro Rosso, just for this reason. Okay. And, uh, um, Lorenzo, scusi. Yes. That's one of the four words in Italian I know, scusi. Um, folks, just, just to explain very slightly, because I'm very conscious uh, of two things. One, Arezzo is beautifully in the centre of Italy, and I, I was thinking of where's the centre of the UK, it's Milton Keynes. I think they've got it better than we have. Um, but well, just to, many of our tasters who live anywhere near Milton Keynes, I think. Just to, ex yeah, <laughs> yes, other towns are available. Um, <laughs> just to explain a little bit about what Lorenzo was saying there, because Lorenzo is fabulously knowledgeable on this. 
but I'm conscious that we're trying to catch up with him. In the centre of Tuscany, between Firenze or Florence, as we call it, and Siena, is the area known as Chianti. In Chianti, the rules for making wines are very strict, and it is about using the grape Sangiovese. Which is what you make you use to make which the is what, which in, is what you're using yeah. to make his amazing Chianti. Yeah. <laughs> and back in the 1980s, I think it was, um, international winemakers, particularly from what we bizarrely call the New World, Australia and New Zealand, arrived in in Tuscany and discovered this Sangiovese grape was fantastic. But they <laughs> felt by blending it with varieties that people knew outside of Italy, like Merlot, like Syrah, like Cabernet Sauvignon, that they could lift the wine to a whole new level that would give it a wider audience. The Chianti authorities, in a very typically Italian way, threw their hands in the air and said, no, 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 you cannot do this. If you do anything other than Sangiovese, you cannot call it Chianti. And Quite people, right. And Gee. being Australian and Kiwi, hopefully I'm not going to offend anybody here, but if I am, I really don't mind. Um, they said, do you know what? We don't care because we're not going to call it Chianti. And they said, no, but you cannot call it DOC or DOCG. And these are the quality levels in Italian wine. They said, we don't care. And they were going to, so they started making these wines, blending the traditional Sangiovese grape, but bringing other international grapes in. Uh, but they had to be called IGT. And IGT is the Italian equivalent of Van de Pai, as we know it in France. So it just means it's come from that region. And so they started creating these stunning wines. I mean, absolutely stellar wines yeah. on the world scale. They were awesome, but they couldn't call it a DOC or a DOCG because it didn't fit any of the rules of Italian winemaking. Winemaking, winemaking, winemaking. But you're right. But you're right. This expression, super tasty, a marketing um, expression that's been developed um, to describe them. The funny thing is, Penny, I, years ago, I used to have a real job and we were talking about something called Super Tuscan. We were trying to do some stuff then. And it turns out the name Super Tuscan was registered by, you heard it here, but don't repeat it, folks, Sainsbury's. Oh, no. <laughs> they actually registered the name Super Tuscan. But you will never see Super Tuscan written on a bottle of wine. So Lorenzo is absolutely right. You're buying a bottle of wine that just said, Tuscan red wine. Now, at the top end of this scale, and I have to tell you, Lorenzo's wines are up there with this quality. Yeah, but if you buy a bottle of Sassacaya or Ornolaya or Tignanello, you're paying like 500 quid for a bottle of these wines. Yep. And it just says Tuscan red wine. And so it's a real minefield. But what you've got here with our dear friend, Senor P Pitera, is a fabulous wine that you don't have to pay 500 quid for but you have to know what you're doing but super tuscan is a word that is never written down anywhere no you never see it on a on a on a label no. uh, on, on a on a on a label, no. um, a label. Lorenzo, please forgive me it's just it, it doesn't mean a lot to people if they haven't come across it, it. so it, lorenzo back to you, you and your it's fabulous quite wine. it's quite hard to explain now <clears throat> Lorenzo, you were telling me last week that the, um, the the mulberry bushes that you have lining the great big long drive up to the up to the village and the winery, um, in the middle of the night sometimes you can see up to twenty wild boar feasting on all those mulberry bushes. Now we always say that this wine goes really really well with wild boar, but that's not something that we get very often here in the UK, unfortunately. <laughs> But we do have an amazing um, salami that the, uh, that our, um, our, ch our friends from Hampshire have given us today. Now, Steve, should we chase the cheese first or the salami first? Do you know what? You're all over 18. Do whatever you like. Do whatever you like. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to suggest that we try the uh, salami tonight, which is the Hampshire Black, which is quite a peppery one. It's, it's going to be more spicy, but I think it's going to really work with this Moro Rosso. And now, I think the fact, that, the fact that Lorenzo has used Syrah in here 
yeah. that Syrah has got this slightly spiciness to it, slightly pepperiness, I think worked beautifully. Lorenzo, back to you and your, uh, Lorenzo, I'm very impressed that you, you have got your walls colour coordinated with your wine. <laughs> Sorry, Lorenzo. So, 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 really beautiful, beautiful wine. Fantastic colours. Deep. And I'm getting on the nose. I'm really getting those blackberry flavours that you're talking about. Maybe it's not the blackberry. Maybe it's the mulberry I'm smelling. And licorice. Go ahead, Lorenzo. Tell us more. Yeah, yes, uh, you can, you, uh, so uh, we can start with the, with the color. If you can look at the color, the color of the wine, it's deep uh, ruby red because uh, this Yura, uh, grape, uh, it's uh, usually is darker comparing at Merlot and Sangiovese. And so for this reason, it's more dark compared to the wine because it's, Yura, it's, uh, it's really dark. Yeah. And uh, you can testing the, the blackberry for sure. Uh, a note of pepper and uh, at the end a note of liquorice as well. Yeah, it's definitely. a well balanced wine. It's not so tannic because uh, uh, this wine it is stored for a couple of years in a big wooden barrel from Slovenia and the French tonneau. Tonneau it's a uh, uh, 500 liter barrel, and we use a part of a big barrel and a part of a small barrel and our analogies at the end of two years uh, mix the wine. And uh, it's a long at the end and uh, my opinion, the best uh, combination is for sure with uh, uh, the best uh, dishes, uh, uh, Tuscan dishes, uh, Italian Tuscan beef, Tuscan meat, but uh, it is amazing with uh, cheese of course, and the fantastic uh, with uh, Parmigiana, for example, if uh, there are vegetarian and don't uh, eat uh, beef, uh, meat in general, it's amazing with Parmigiana. Do you know Parmigiana? Parmigiana is made with uh, uh, aubergine and uh, one side of aubergine, one side of uh, mozzarella cheese, uh, Parmigiana on the top and tomato. So it's amazing. It's a That's typical the south of Italy, but everywhere in UK, UK, you can eat in Italy. And sometime in the summertime, uh, I'd like to cook uh, for uh, our guests in our tourismo. And uh, we, we cook uh, Parmigiana because uh, the, the, the tomato and uh, the mozzarella cheese, it's a perfect match with, uh, with our Marolos. Lorenzo, I have never told Steve that you are actually a qualified chef. I probably should have told him that before now, but I have been very uh, lucky to have, have been served the most amazing food by Lorenzo. I forgot to mention that fact, Steve, sorry about that. <laughs> and he has made the beef that he mentioned before with rosemary, which was just the first time I'd ever had beef and rosemary together. It was amazing and various other delicious dishes. But next time I come, Lorenzo, I want that that you've just described. It sounds absolutely phenomenal, uh, really delicious. But um, tonight we don't, we actually have a pecorino. We don't have a, a parmigiana, we have a pecorino cheese. A, tos a pecorino toscano, I should say. Yeah. So what is pecorino? Pe pecora is Italian for sheep. And, yep. And pecorino basically means sheep's milk cheese. Um, for your further edification, in France it's brebi. You know, so in the same way we use the word chèvre to describe any goat's cheese in France, we use the word pecorino to describe any sheep's cheese in Italy. Um, why so much sheep? Well, as, as I've said many times, Italy can be quite a mountainous country, lots of hills, particularly in Toscano, and cows aren't very good at climbing hills. They're quite lazy animals. Goats and sheep do it very well, and therefore they tend to have a lot of sheep. It's quite practical, really. Yeah. This is what happens from listening to the archers. You see, you learn this stuff. Um, now, pecorino is made in many different areas of Italy, but there are only four PDO pecorino. So this is the 
the protected designation of origin. We were talking about AOC and DOC earlier. It's all, all the same thing, all, all these things. So the registered ones are Siciliano, Sardo, Romano, and Toscano. And so we have a Toscano here tonight, yeah. which is made in Tuscany from sheep, uh, from sheep's milk. It has what you would always find with a hard sheep's cheese. It has a slightly oily texture to it. Mm, it does. You could say soapy if you were being critical. And what that is, is lanolin. And lanolin is a, an enzyme produced by sheep that's secreted under the skin to keep their wool soft and supple. Most people think lanolin is something you put in shower gel to keep your skin soft and lovely, which it, it does do that as well. <laughs> but um, what, what, what it does here is it comes through into the cow's, uh, sorry, the sheep's digestive system, into their milk, and therefore into the cheese. So it gives it this slight oiliness. Now, God, I, I really hate saying this in front of somebody Italian. Many Italian restaurants in Britain, when you go in and they come out with the massive great pepper mill, have you all been there when they come out this thing about three foot big, would you like black pepper? Yeah. And then they come out this huge bowl and say, would you like Parmesan? Parmesan is a British word that means either Parmigiano Reggiano, which is a PDO product, or Grana Padana, which is a similar product made up in the north, yeah. or a Pecorino. But we use them all and call them Parmesan. <coughs> so yep. we all just call them Parmesan because we're peasants. They are very, very different styles of cheese. But I personally think that the Parmesan brings an umami element to Lorenzo's fabulous wine here. Mm -hmm. So it picks up this slightly sour sort of flavor, works well with it. Whereas the Pecorino picks up the sweetness in the wine. So you've got almost a slight sweetness here. If you want to enhance this pecorino that you've got in front of you, cut it into thin slices, put it on a little plate, drizzle some honey around the outside. If you've got acacia honey, it's fantastic. And then, and here's a retro thing, sprinkle some white pepper on top of the honey. Have you got any white pepper in the house? Of course you haven't. You're too poncy. You've got black pepper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But get yourself some white pepper with some honey and mm. pecorino it is fantastic now we wouldn't I, normally um eat in, in this country wouldn't eat chunks of parmesan or mm. i don't think i've ever eaten a chunk of pecorino before i've used it in recipes but not really as a chunk but again one of the first times i went to um lorenzo's winery il, il tinto palazzo i had a fresh parmesan uh, parmigiano and it was, we were just amazed that it was just so delicious to mm. have as, as a chunk of a, chi a cheese Fabulous. And it goes really, really well. You're absolutely right. It goes really well with the um, red now, wine. The, red the, wine. Thing, the thing with this wine is Moro Rosso. Mm. If you take the three wines we've had tonight, the first wine, if I was asked to use one word to describe the wine and food, it'd be delicate. Yeah, I would say if that. If I was use, asked to use one word to describe the second wine and the food to go with it, it would be vegetables. Vegetables mm -hmm. and herbs. Okay. I was used asked to do a word to do with this. It's big flavour. This needs big flavour, this wine. So whether it be Parmigiana, whether it be Pecorino, whether it be a vintage cheddar or an aged chowder or my all-time favourite, Old Winchester. Go and buy some, folks. It's brilliant. Or red meat or game or salami, which Penny will come back to. Oh, yeah. Or fungi, which is mushrooms or aubergines, or pappadelli al cingale, which is a, a ragu sauce made with wild boar. Penny's absolutely right. Getting wild boar is a bit tricky in your average corner shop in the UK. Go to a good butcher's, they might be able to get you some. Or get some rare breed pork, it could be quite nice. Yeah, wild boar running through the, the winery though, fantastic. And you know, oh, I mean, th this is a wine just designed for flavour. This absolutely. is not for lightweights. So che cheers to all you flavour freaks tonight. Love it. So Lorenzo, uh, this is one of your super Tuscans. There is that you have a couple of others in the range, the Maspino, which is a Syrah, which is delicious. And your Chianti we tasted last week as well with you, also good. And you've just introduced a couple of um, whites and a rosé, a Vermentino 
And uh, what's the rosé one made from? The rosé, it is made with the brand of uh, two kind of uh, red grapes, uh, Syrah and Sangiovese. The, oh, yeah, the one it's rosé because uh, it's made with the pressing, we pressing very softly the, yeah. the, red, the red grapes because uh, if you open uh, uh, red grapes, uh, if you cut in the middle, inside is white, right. the skin is red. And the wine become red because the juice is in contact with the skin uh, between two and three weeks, uh, sometimes more. For this reason, the wine become red. Otherwise, uh, uh, is white, the, 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 the wine. In, in, in the case of rosé, we're pressing very softly the red grape and become rosé for this grape. Yeah. And then we produce amazing Vermentino as well. Vermentino is one of uh, the most typical white grape in Tuscany area. Uh, it's wine with a body, uh, but at the same time, it's a fresh wine. So it's interesting because you can drink uh, in summertime uh, with uh, light, uh, light food, but at the same time in winter time, for Christmas time, maybe you have uh, amazing uh, uh, seafood in your table. It's, uh, it's amazing one. Oh, I, I, I agree. Having tasted it recently again, it's fabulous. Thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo. Thank you, Steve. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask either Steve or Lorenzo? And um, please unmute yourself to, to ask those questions because they're here. They can ask, answer anything you want. Lorenzo, <clears throat> we're thinking about organizing a trip to come and stay with you guys in May 2022, which seems like years away. But given all the problems that we've got traveling, I think we won't uh, get there till then. So um, it'd be delightful to be able to come and stay. And I'll, I'll tell everybody about that trip that we're going to come and do with you. Uh, come and, won't we won't be at harvest time because harvest is usually September, end of September. In the, in the middle. Every year is different because it depends about the season. It depends if uh, we have uh, a dry summer or if uh, during the summer, rains a lot, but more or less uh, it's uh, in the middle of a week or in the middle of September. Sometimes we can start uh, one week uh, uh, after or one week later, it, it depends. Yeah. But we'll be, we'll be able to see the wine, the vines just beginning to flower, just beginning to fruit, uh, walk through the olive trees, olive grove. Go on, Steve, what were you going to say? I was going to say it would be lovely to have a couple of people ask questions because I, I don't know about you, I get sick of the sound of my voice. Yeah, we love it here. Some of these folks, just, even if they just say hi, you're looking good, Lorenzo. Okay, so I'm going to ask the question then. Um, does anybody have a favourite wine tonight? Quite often, I when I ask people what their favourite wines are, they they put their hands up for all three of them. Does anybody have a particular favourite tonight? And don't just say Moro Rosso because Lorenzo's here. Prosecco. Yeah. Uh, okay. Unmute it. Go on. Elliot's saying definitely the red. I have to say mine is definitely the red too. Yeah, Karen's saying the red too. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think the red is definitely my favorite tonight. <laughs> so cheers, Lorenzo. Fantastic. I don't notice you're not drinking. What's going on? <laughs> Why aren't you drinking tonight? To be honest, uh, in this moment, I am in my office, uh, but I have a bottle of Moroso, okay? Good. And then I prepare my wife, Fernandina, for me. He prepared amazing uh, meat tonight. And uh, for sure, I opened the bottle of more. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so unless nobody's got any questions, I would bid you all farewell. Thank you so much, Lorenzo, for joining us again this evening. It was great fun to have you here. We'll no doubt speak to you soon. Steve, thank you again for all of your uh, amusing and um, slightly tricky questions and comments sometimes but you know great food and wine pairings there um everybody we're doing and then our next taste is actually not till may the 8th we're doing one on um germany this time i'm quite excited about that one because we're going to be looking at some really interesting wines from from the mosel valley um i think you know my view of, of german wines has changed a lot in the last 15 years we tend to think of them as very sweet, but the ones we're going to be tasting on the 6th of May, Steve, are totally, totally different. Sorry, May, mm. totally, totally different. Um, we've got Matt, who's joining us from the Dr. Lucen uh, Winery in the Mosel Valley. So that's a very interesting one I'm looking forward to. Um, but I'd like to wish everybody a happy, happy evening. 
uh, don't spend too much time down the pub now that you can. <laughs> but uh, thanks very much, Steve. Thanks very much, Lorenzo, and see you all very soon. Yeah. Take Good evening, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you, Penny. Thank you, Steve. Bye, Graham. Thank bye, you. Lorenzo. Goodbye, <coughs> Tina. Goodbye, Florian. Goodbye, Ellie. Goodbye, Karen. <laughs> Stay for the after party. Exactly. Steve, what are you? Are you okay? Yeah, fine. Thank you, Lorenzo. How are you?